Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo and we are here most every week talking about all things Gig Performer, tips, tricks, how to use it, and my personal favorite, interviews with actual Gig Performer users who are using Gig Performer software to power their live performance. Today, we've got a great interview with professional bassist Froda. Um, I think his last name is Berg. Probably should have wrote that down before I started trying to say it on live on the internet. But if you're tuning in right now and you're a bass player, um, why don't you let us know that in the chat? Um, I know we get a couple bass players coming through every week who are using Gig Performer, but if you're here, please reveal yourself. Coming up very soon, uh, I believe March 2nd, we've got another special guest, um, Alex, who's coming in from Germany. He's going to be talking about how he took his entire hardware rig um, and moved it over to Gig Performer in just two weeks uh, using a, just a super simple set of plugins um, and redid his whole live set. Uh, he's got a really interesting story, so make sure you mark your calendars for that. Um, it's going to be a great time. Thank you so much, friends, for being here. Without further ado, we're going to bring on today's special guest. So uh, welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer, Froda. How are you doing today? Hey, great, great. How are you? Doing well, man. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I know we've talked a couple times already, but for people who you know don't know who you are, um, who maybe aren't on the forums, you're a pro bassist. Um, what's like the overview of your career? Like, tell us what you do, what you've been doing, what you're doing now. Oh, oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big first question. You can yeah, give us that... some notes. I know you've, you've been it, all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I started like uh, most, I suppose, in a yeah. uh, rock band uh, in my teens. Wow. Um, I went through high school, college, uh, studying some music, going like a music path through those schools. Yeah. Um, my main instrument was bass guitar, and when I was around 17, 18, I switched the main instrument to the upright bass. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and um, kept on doing that parallel with the, with the electric bass. Uh, I went to the Norwegian State Academy uh, studying classical upright bass, Bowie, mm -hmm. playing yes. uh, all kinds of classical music. Um, with the late great Knut Guttler. Um, mm. And then at that time I auditioned uh, as a substitute for all the professional orchestras in Norway and I got approved for that. So I started working with them as a sub, like they were calling me when somebody called in sick and you know, can you come yeah. play and yes, no. And also during the time in the State Academy, I got a call um, if I would be interested in uh, subbing in Donna Summer's um, European touring band. Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. And that was through um, a teacher at school. Um, mm -hmm. I was attending some rhythm section classes and this teacher, he was playing with a, a Norwegian band leader who also has a career in America. He has later moved to the States. Mm. So he's now a trombone player with the blood, sweat and tears and lots of stuff. Cool, and he cool. was musical director for Donna Summer for many, many years. And of course, I fell out of my chair when I got that call. I was like, <laughs> OK, ooh, well, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I was like 20 at the time or something like that. And the, the, the first gig, this was my first professional gig uh, as a bassist, mm. um, was with Donna Summer in the sporting club in Monaco. And we flew business class and we were picked up by limousines and there were like backline companies. Everything was taken care of. We stayed at the, the most expensive hotel in Monaco. Wow. So that's, I thought, okay, being a musician, that that's, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and and since, since, since that, it's been going, you know, one way. <laughs> So that was some start. So I did that, a few gigs of that here and there yeah. in, in Europe, not really many, but I, I started working, um, the bass player who regularly worked with uh, this musical director, his name is Jens Wendelbu, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, he was uh, pursuing a different career path. So, so he quit the group and mm -hmm. suddenly I was his uh, first call bass player and I did a lot of TV work, uh, a lot of studio stuff, uh, a lot of events. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things, uh, mostly on electric bass, um, yeah. a little bit of jazz, upright bass on the side. I actually mm -hmm. quit playing classical bass um, after a few years of that because I, I got really busy on, on the um, uh, rhythm bass scene, yeah. uh, if, if that's a word. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I did a lot of theater gigs, um, studio work, as I said, had some regular bands I was playing with. Uh, Norway is a small country, so touring in Norway is very on and off. You can like, maybe you can get like two weeks uh, of touring mm -hmm. <laughs> with sure. one band yeah. if you're lucky, but most of the time you're doing like two or three gigs and then you wait for half a year and then you do a couple more gigs. So if you can put together like a, a week of work, then that's pretty good. But anyway, I was doing all kinds of stuff like that. And after about 10, 15 years, I found in my closet uh, my upright bass bow. Uh, and I figured, okay, well, this freelance musician thing is, it was working out really well, but you know, there are bumps. So you, you have a lot of work and then you have no work for a week yes. or two. And then you have like all kinds of stuff. So I figured maybe I can get the chops back together again and, and start subbing a little bit. And that's another source of income right. and I did that and they they took me back in the orchestras because I told them that I couldn't do any more subbing because I had too much electric bass work and that was the priority at the time mm -hmm. um, but when I called them back they were really cool I said yeah 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 we can you can come and play Verdi Requiem next week if you want and I was like oh okay that was a <laughs> national wow. radio orchestra so, wow. so I, I did that and that went really well and it was fun and I, I kept practicing with the bow and stuff and uh, kept um, doing um, having a jazz career. I was touring a lot in Europe with a, a Norwegian trio and eventually also with a Polish violin player called Adam Baldich. Uh, we mm -hmm. were touring all over Poland and Eastern Europe and like big festivals in yeah all over the place really. So... Um, so, so yeah, I was quite busy doing that. And then a position opened up in the Oslo Philharmonic uh, for um, Tutti, Tutti double bass, which is mm -hmm. a section player. Okay. And at the time I was, I had a substitute for three months in the orchestra at the same time playing um, the musical Mamma Mia with music of Abba. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and touring with this trio and this violin player and stuff so and I thought that okay well this seems like it can work together I can maybe so I, I can at least I can have um, a project for myself of practicing a lot getting really into the classical thing and that's never a bad idea anyway because everything is transferable to jazz bass and electric bass and it's mm. you know you, you practice one thing you grow on the other one automatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I applied for the position and I thought that, well, this is my project and I will never get it because these jobs that there's like very many applicants mm -hmm. and they come from all over the world. So there were um, bass players from uh, the States, Canada, there were bass players from, from Russia, from all over Europe. And in some kind of random way, I managed to win the audition and I got offered the job. So this was after like 17 years of being a full-time professional jazz musician. Wow. So, yeah, so I, I got a lot of wow <laughs> text yeah. messages that day, like, oh, what, what just happened, you know? Yeah. And that's like 10, 10, 12 years ago. And I've been trying to, obviously now there's, it's more orchestral work because this is now a full-time job, but whenever I can, I try to get, it, get, get out or not get out, but I try mm -hmm. to do other stuff on the side so mm -hmm. yeah it's very yeah it's been a it's been a journey it's been a, yeah, yeah, a, a yeah. long journey that's really yeah. awesome yeah. um so i'm anyway we're going to talk about gig performer for sure but i'm like listening to your story what made you like you're 17 or 18 years old you're playing electric bass what made you pick up a double bass like what made you think that was a good idea how did that happen did you like classical <laughs> music before then I, I always hear people going the other way. They like fall in love with the upright and they then pick up the bass guitar. But um. yeah, well, um, uh, my parents were into music, not professionally, but uh, there was always music around the house. My mother, um, she was or is, they are still both here, uh, fortunately. Uh, she, she was a piano player, uh, like amateur and a singer. Mm -hmm. uh, she actually sang with the Oslo Philharmonic Choir for a while, which is an amateur choir. So, cool. so that was on the side. And my father, uh, he's retired now, but he was um, what's he called? A vicar, okay, a priest, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. in in uh, in the church. And he was working in the Norwegian Seamen's uh, Mission for some years. So we lived abroad uh, six years of my childhood. Wow. Okay. And three of those were in uh, London 
um, where they had this house orchestra with the um, people at the church. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a bass player. So my dad bought uh, an upright bass in London. Uh, he had wow. played some guitar before and he taught himself, you know, basic positions in the first position and how to mm -hmm. just accompany um, mm -hmm. songs. So yeah. there was a double bass. There was an upright bass in in my house uh, yeah. through my youth, but it, it was bass. It was unplayable at the time. Uh, yeah, it was completely messed up. But yeah, wow. so okay. that's maybe why. And also, I had a bass teacher for a few years. Uh, he, he was really, really a great bass teacher. Uh, his name was Remo from Bratislava, I think. Uh, he was living in Norway for quite many years and was working in the um, the school where I. I went through my teens okay. and then for the last year he said that I needed um, to go go on with someone else like he couldn't teach me anything more that was what he, he meant yeah so I I, I got a teacher um, uh, quite a no well-known Norwegian bass player teacher who said yes to do it and then in the last moment he couldn't after all because he got some kind of commitment for the whole year or something okay and then I was there without the bass teacher so it was just like the school was about to start and I thought, oh okay I'll do double bass then <laughs> so gotcha that's how that happened it wasn't I wasn't <laughs> planning that it was just okay. okay we'll just do double bass instead yeah it's so, so good i i'm i know this is part of your story but as you're talking i'm like i remember trying to contract bass players for musicals and the amount of people that i couldn't hire because they didn't play both right <laughs> just, yeah <laughs> just like really needing somebody to be able to come in and actually play electric and upright proficiently yeah, and when, like, go ahead. when you when you add in um, the ability to to play in an in a large orchestra with classically trained uh, colleagues, um, either as a rhythm section or in in the section, it's also um, a skill that I feel has really helped my whole career um, mm -hmm. because it's it's very difficult to get this kind of practice, and it's a complete different world than playing in a band, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Both if you're playing electric bass with an orchestra, it's the mechanisms of the orchestra. How does it feel? The conductor says one, but the beat is never there, right? It's like a little bit later. So you kind <laughs> yeah. of get used to that. And nobody knows how to do that if they don't do it quite a lot. And you don't yes. get to do it a lot because if you do it once and you mess it up, then they won't call you back. <laughs> you know? Right. So I was fortunate in that, that I kind of snuck in that way also. So I've done a lot of uh, rhythm section work with the radio broadcasting orchestra. I've done a lot of uh, chamber music and, and rhythm section work with other orchestras. So that's been great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember having such a hard time with that. Like I would, you know, always in the jazz world or at the very least musical theater where like everything is so it feels more like a metronome, right? Like when you're playing with that type of a thing, it really feels like the beat is exactly where the beat is. Mm -hmm. And then working with some conductors who came from the classical world and being like, man, I don't speak your language. Like, right. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're, we're not talking about the same thing. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. It's so, completely different, but there, I can tell you there is so much to learn from both sides for both yeah. kinds of musicians. I'm really interested in this and how, what kind of synergies you can find from working both places? What can I learn from my classical colleagues and their way of phrasing, you know, in mm -hmm. having a flexible beat, but still there's a pocket, but the pocket is kind of wider, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and deeper. And, and what can I, as a classical player, bring into the orchestra from having done this, a lot of grid-based music, you know, like you're trying to lock into a click track or whatever yeah. you know so so what both what the things are really great what have you like what have you learned like it's, it's probably such a broad question i guess specifically what i'm thinking is like you know when you're like approaching music now you have like knowledge of both of these senses of freezing and time like are is there an overlap that you feel like has allowed you to be a better musical thinker and if so what is that there are several overlaps, I think. Yeah. Um, and one major one is, of course, this time thing. Um, yeah. Like in the rhythm world, if I just to call it that, um, yeah. 
as a rhythm section player, it's like the groove is everything, right? Yeah. It's, it's mainly about how you lock with the drums and how the drums and bass can propel the whole whole band and everything. And But we are maybe not traditionally so flexible in our time, you know? Mm -hmm. And But when you listen to the really great, uh, famous bass players, when they take a fill, um, like Jameson or... or yeah, man. There's, yeah. there's loads of these these old guys, you know, from the soul and, and Motown, and, and and you can. It's never. It doesn't always line up to the grid, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. to to kind of learn that because this is the thing in classical is that there is no people practice with the metronome, but you kind of try to to sculpt the phrases so that it maybe drag it maybe rushes a little bit in the middle or somewhere mm -hmm. else. And then mm -hmm. it drags towards the next down bit or something like that. So uh, as um, a set of eighth notes, it's it's never like. It could be, you know, it could be more more like. But maybe mm -hmm. without yeah. messing them up, you know. Um, <laughs> so when when, when sure. you're playing in line. It's all in time, sort mm -hmm. of, kind of, you know, but I'm trying to pull. Yeah. You know, and, and this is, I, th I think this is really fascinating. We play, I'm so fortunate, Oslo Philharmonic is one of the top orchestras in, in Europe, actually. And we tour a lot in, we're going on a three week tour of Asia in the fall and then a week in Europe. And, and we record, we make recordings all the time with all the top soloists. So it's very fascinating to hear how these little inflections of time can differ in the same piece. Like when we play a Beethoven violin concerto, for instance, it can be so different, even though it's written like, you know, 300 years ago and everybody mm -hmm. has played it. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, that actually blows my mind a little bit. You're giving me some language to understand some things I've bumped into. Um, one of my 15 jobs is transcribing music mm -hmm. for um, for jazz jazz students, actually. And there have been a handful of ideas by like fantastic soloists, you know, Bobby Timmons or whatever, Hank Mobley, like these guys. And I sit down to write it out, and I'm like, you can't write it. <laughs> like, there's well, no, there's no like I can get close to it, but if you're yeah. not listening it almost seems like classical musicians have figured out how to write it in a rhythmically correct way but play it in a more linguistic fashion right right which it's is, all it's all about the, the the various dialects of the music right yeah i have been teaching quite a bit uh, from time to time and when people come to me and say they want to learn how to play jazz and want to learn how to solo yeah and then i ask them you know maybe during the lesson, I, I ask them, so what kind of stuff are you listening to? And then they tell me it's like uh, electronic dance music or something like that, and or <laughs> heavy metal. Or, and I yeah. say, well, if you want to learn how to play jazz, you have to immerse yourself in the music, in the language, because you can't, yeah. it's just like trying to learn a language from just reading a book. Yeah. You know, you can learn the words, you can teach yourself some sentences and stuff, but you'll never sound like that langu language. You need yeah. to... To get to get the dialect down yes yeah. yeah man you're like preaching to the choir i have some we could talk about this all day yeah. i'm like yes <laughs> everybody everybody on this um like just immersing yourself and like digging into things right, right. um okay so you did a lot of session playing mm -hmm. for many many years yep pre-gig performer what were you bringing with you like what was a typical you got called for some gig what gear was coming with you to those those gigs whatever whatever it, it, it was that you were playing well uh in those years i mean now i'm thinking if i had gig performer 25 years ago <laughs> life would be so easy <laughs> right but um yeah i was bringing a, a couple of bass guitars maybe a fretless and a five string or something and then uh upright bass uh, for m many of my gigs were double doubling gigs, so playing both both right. uh, things for TV shows or or whatever they were. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would never bring two amps, you know. Uh, and 
a bass amplifier is anyway just uh, a bass player's personal monitor most of the time, not always, but, but quite a lot, especially on TV gigs and with orchestras where you, you can't really be playing in loud anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so I would put the electric bass down, pull out the jack plug and get the upright bass and put it in and then set the levels and the gain and the EQ, you know, quickly. Sometimes there was like 20 seconds from the end of one piece to the start of the next and it was a hassle and it was live TV often. Mm -hmm. So so with gig performer now I can just I just press a button and, and obviously I have to put the bass down and pick the other one up but I, at least I don't have to uncable and everything is then set up as it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you have a very large car to transport your stuff? I know that's a. I'm like trying to envision you get where you have to go. Like that's a lot of gear. You're bringing three bases, an upright base, and a base cabinet. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I you, I had a station wagon. Uh, yeah. So you can fit. I I, I used to drive uh two upright bases in my mother's old uh, lada which is a very small russian box car okay like it's a sedan yeah uh, but I, I wouldn't recommend it because i had to drive without the seat back up and stuff oh. but uh, <laughs> anyway one one upright bass and a couple of bass guitars is not too much but but getting a big amp you, i couldn't do obviously so yeah. when i was doubling i was just bringing a small you know like one one ten inch or 12 inch speaker 12 inch probably yeah, uh, and yeah. that was everything I could fit. And but in the radio for TV gigs and stuff, they often had provided backline, so Got so it. they would put some stuff there and I'll play through that. Yeah, sweet, mm. sweet. So you found Gig Performer, I would say, within the last year. Is that correct? Yeah, I yeah. actually feel a little bit funny being here because I've been seeing all <laughs> these uh, backstage with Gig Performer things with the keyboard players and you have all these elaborate uh, <laughs> things going on and, well, you do this and I'm like, woo, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm very new to this. I have mm -hmm. been bringing it to, to a few gigs um, the last, uh, I will say, four or five months. So it's been a, a variety of different types of gigs. Yeah, and 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 it's really it's it's beautiful how it, how it's working out. Yeah, uh, David, did you want to pop on? Welcome, uh, David. I, I just want to make a comment. I, I know you see a lot of keyboard players, but you'd probably be interested to know that one of our very early users uh, was actually a war guitar player. So he just played basically uh, bass, you know, on, on, a, on a war guitar tray, tray gun. He was yeah. one of the very early users when so we've had non keyboard players around pretty much from the beginning. And in fact, he and a few other non keyboard players were quite instrumental in some of the suggestions. The audio mixer plugins that we have are came from Trey. They were his yeah. suggestions. So just you know, don't don't feel strange <laughs> about not being a keyboard player. No, 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 that's not it. I just feel like I'm I'm too new to gig performer to actually <laughs> have an opinion here or anything it's uh you know something i want to drive home in general thanks for popping in david um which maybe i mentioned this to you too but you know we talk to a lot of people so many musicians coming through so many different levels if you're watching right now and you're in the stream this is i think a general message that most pros will agree with you need a project like context is 95% of everything. And so, you know, <clears throat> whatever people end up building in Gig Performer, the most solid, the most stable, the most creative, um, the most functional, really, Gig Performer sets are created by people who are trying to do something, something specific. Mm -hmm. They have a gig, they have a song, they have whatever it is. We, you know, you start to run into problems with any gear when the gear becomes the project right and the the thing that we get to do as creators is use tools to get the output but if gig performer does its job well no one watching you play knows that you're running gig performer right exactly and i <laughs> i, I yeah. fell victim to the that that, that very thing uh, during the first half year with Geek Performer, I think. Yeah. I was spending like uh, every evening, every night, just noodling around and building different mm -hmm. layouts and, and setups 
yeah. with all kinds of uh, AMP modelers and uh, what, what was they called impulse responses, yeah. you know, cabinet modelers. And mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't getting anything done. Um, mm -hmm. So now I have my, my setup. Now is basically I, I found one AMP and I've decided mm -hmm. to to stick with that. Yep. And then for each project, I'm sort of starting from um, a template, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes it's just an electric base, sometimes it's just an upright base. So I'll just keep that in there and I'll build whatever I want to use after a rehearsal. Maybe I'll, I'll think, oh, this will be cool to, to have some kind of harmonizer somewhere, at least to have it there. And mm -hmm. I'm finding myself, I'm using Gig Performer. Um, Do you want me to put it on the screen? You it, it's up, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I just want to show uh, uh, my setup is a gig performer on the laptop in the background there and an RME interface. It's, yep. uh, I don't remember what it's called. It's not one of the newest one. It's UCX or something. It's the first version. So it's got eight inputs and eight outputs. Great. And then just recently I got um, XLR patch bay. So nice. I, I have all the, the connection, the cabling uh, permanently plugged on the back and then I'm going to get around to labeling those XLRs but mm -hmm. I know where they go so I have like one thing which is for my monitor and one thing for front of house or, mm -hmm. or the studio mm -hmm. and uh, if I get a monitor feed from front of house I put it into another one and then I can get I can mix my own monitors on it mm -hmm. and then I have this second screen next to me on a music mm -hmm. stand like this which is a touch screen mm -hmm. And uh, here I can, uh, because I, I don't play, uh, I, I do a lot of like jazz kind of gigs. Uh, mm -hmm. I also do theater and other stuff, but um, I've been finding myself uh, having some VSTs up, like a delay or a couple of delays and reverb and some pitch things and, and a looper and a freeze thing. And I like to change things while I play and improvise with it. Yes. So 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 that's how I'm I'm using it. Is is basically okay here now. I want to put the reverb in, and I can make it longer, shorter, whatever um, mm -hmm. with my finger. So mm -hmm. I'm not using Gig Performer as a, a pre laid out uh, set list. I, I haven't got into the set list uh, view at all mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. because the gigs are quite open and quite free often. And if they're not, then they're really just playing functional bass you know a, a, mm -hmm. a jazz bass or a p bass mm -hmm. and straight signal so so yep. I, I find i have a template and then, then i just work with that i add vsts and i put a button up and then i have it there and then that's for yeah. that gig and then, yeah <laughs> yeah so tell me about that transition because i feel like this is key for many people what so you were like learning it you were building things but you never really quite found what it was then you decided you were going to like, I guess, build something that worked. What problem were you, were you solving for at that point? Did you decide to build it for a specific project? Was it um, you were like aiming towards being able to easily switch between upright and electric? Like what was the first thing you optimized for that gave you a playable gig performer setup? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was aiming for a simple platform for different kind of sounds like if i want to play upright bass and then something with a bow yeah and depending on what that was it, uh, my upright bass has two uh, signals going into gig performer there's a pickup like a pso pickup mm -hmm. uh, which sounds great for pizzicato stuff but mm -hmm. if you try to play with a bow it's that it's very nasal mm -hmm. so i have a dpa microphone attached to the bass on the second channel and i can i can on my screen i can mix between those and i can yes. set up these uh variations yes uh, yep. where i can have uh, on one variation is maybe for bowing a section of something and then i can hit the pedal and it's back to more of the piezo of the pizzicato more mm -hmm. accompaniment yeah. thing so yeah. so that's good and um and i was using I, i've had various uh, variations of pedal boards from mm -hmm. like really small ones with um, one multi-effect and a tuner maybe or <laughs> something and then to elaborate big ones with uh, this um switch loop switcher things that had eight you know eight loops and so but they got really heavy and, yeah. and cumbersome and there's a lot of cabling that can go wrong 
Mm -hmm. uh, cables can break. I was using this solderless thing, so making my own cables in the right lengths and stuff. And then, yeah. But then on a gig, I'm, I'm like, oh, I wish I had this pedal now. <laughs> right. You know, and I wish I had this pedal after the distortion or up before the octave or whatever it was. You know, and it was like with a switcher, sometimes you could move the change the order of things, but physical pedals even though they're beautiful and they sound great and 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 i love them uh, everything but it, it yeah. became a bit of a hassle because i do so many different kind of projects yes um, i think if i played like if i was in a very hugely successful touring band playing a show every night i probably would would maybe have been a pedal board and that would be set up to work mm -hmm. with that but when mm -hmm. I'm going from from a like a free bag jazz thing mm -hmm. uh, into a fusion thing on electric bass and then a theater kind of thing doubling, it's, yeah, I, I can't really bring one pedal board which was designed for a funk band or something. It doesn't work with everything. But here right. I can just you know make new pedal boards all the time. But right. I've come to realize that it's a good idea to to not have a thousand VSTs which yeah. I suppose we all have. Yeah. But it, it takes so much time, you know, to wade through all of those. So, so yeah. that's why I've decided to kind of, because back in the day I had like, I had a few amps, but I had like one amp, which was a main amp. And that's what I'm thinking here. I have one amp and mm -hmm. then for my, what's it called? Um, the global rack space, I use yep. uh, kind of the same for everything I, in there I have, I have my inputs going from the global rack space, yeah, through some volume stuff, and 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 then I have some send things like I can show you, yeah. Uh, if I can get this to work, rack space is wiring. Cool. Um, how can I zoom so, like that? Okay. Yeah, uh, sweet. So this is very basic. This is not okay. crazy cabling and, and stuff. It's just my interface in. And um, I'm not sure if it's possible to do it, but it would be nice to have some kind of a marking thing. Oh, so sure. Because sometimes you know I what? forget what is what. <laughs> There's actually a post. Um, I'll make sure it's linked in the description for viewers later. Somebody else had the same thought and they came up with a pretty creative solution. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll link that for viewers later. But yeah, so... You sometimes forget what the cables are, but those are your inputs that are running into that mixer. Yeah, yeah, yeah it goes into the mixer. Uh, so the first one, yeah, it's it's a piezo, and then it's a mic from the upright bass, and then it's an electric bass one, electric bass two. So I have two different ones, and they're going into this. I don't know why I made it eight channel. I, mm -hmm. I just did, I suppose. And then it just goes back to rack spaces. And here, when I when I switch uh, from from uh, electric bass to upright bass, this is what happens. It solos uh -huh. those two, and so there's no electric bass signals going through. Yep. And and back into the electric bass like that. Nice. And what are you using to switch those? Um... Uh, it's a Morningstar uh, oh, MIDI thing. Yeah. Yeah. Have you? I have a friend who loves that and thinks yeah. it's the best. Have you? Are you, are you enjoying that pedal? Yeah, it's great. It's great. Uh, there's a learning curve, uh, yeah. and mm -hmm. there's because because it's basically it's it's a blank slate. Mm -hmm. You you get the thing and you can do everything in the world, but it's mm -hmm. blank. It's it's doing when you open it up, it does absolutely nothing. So <laughs> you have to go in and you have to set it up, and then you have to understand what the various commands are and what you know. You can there's you can have it do one thing on the first press and something else when you release it, and then. A third thing when you press it again and it can do all kinds of weird stuff oh wow um, yeah yeah so and you can attach four um external pedals to it i have two expression pedals and two uh, three button switches um okay. but you can have four expression pedals or four whatever you want wow. so it's yeah wow. it's, it's it's a really great piece of kit so that's so... how i use that so you you're running it in through there that goes to your local rack spaces and it looks like you're pulling it back in as well on on the right side of the screen is that true yeah so this okay. is a uh, local rack spaces so this is my electric base uh chain it's mm -hmm. coming from uh, channel three which is my first and and for this rack space um it's going through a, a mixer for for a picture thing cool which, cool uh, yeah 
So what so. what is the the pitch like? It it's like an octave pitcher that you've got going on, or what? Uh, yeah, it's uh, so the basic uh, thing. I, I can run you through some of these uh, yeah. sounds. Yeah, that'd be super cool. Um, let me see. Yeah, few of those Sweet. basic sounds. Yeah. So um, back to this. Uh, so wait, one. sorry, just to pull that apart, because I'm yeah. like, just so people understand, it sounds to me like you created, you used some harmonics that you ended up looping with the delay. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so like right, the feedback of the delay, you turned way up. Yeah, the delay is is in the um, from part of this uh, in the global rack space. Gotcha. Gotcha. And all the all the um, signals one two three four uh -huh. go to the same place. This is a little bit messy now because it's, oh, it's yeah it's it's visible yeah yeah. So they all go into this um, effect uh, instrument. Okay. Select I've called it just because when I when I choose a different instrument, uh, this is electric basses and this one and two is a double bass. So mm -hmm. when I send to the reverb or the delay, I want to make sure it's not sending the upright bass, which is standing on a stand with its open strings. So that, you know, right. it, that might be a problem if it's next to the drums and yes. it, it's, it's not muted, you know, everything mm -hmm. will be delayed. So, and it goes from there and into a mixer between um, delay and reverb, yep. um, which I then control um uh, this is a delay volume i'm controlling okay. that with an expression pedal and when i have the feedback which i'm i'm controlling here on this midi thing on my music stand mm -hmm. uh, when his feedback is on full it is just 100 percent, so it doesn't oscillate but it, it just stays not forever but quite quite a long time so i can um i can i now it's not going to the delay Gotcha. There's some reverb there, but when I... Mm -hmm. And then when I turn the pedal off again... And then I can I add some more... Oops. Aha! Yes. Yeah. So that's so, how that works. And to get rid of it, I, I can, I've got um, the mix thing here, so I can fade it out, or I can simply just turn the feedback down and then it will fade out by itself. Right. Yeah. Somebody we had on last time was doing something similar where because you're using a send, mm -hmm. you can add what you want to your delay. Yep at any point and cut it off. And so you're using an expression pedal to turn that volume on. Kevin wrote in and, and asked that. But the, the thing that's moving your um, yes. your delay volume is an expression pedal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sweet, sweet. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, and then the other sound you heard was this um, uh, Eventide plugin, which is a four four voice pitch shifter. Okay. And I've just got it set. It's panned a little bit. I, I'm sending all this in stereo, by the way. Gotcha. So, gotcha. so this has just uh, one octave up and two octaves up, and they're panned different ways. And there's there's nothing more happening here, really. But um, I'm filtering those. I'm filtering off the top end, so it's a bit more mellow. And if I take yep. that off, uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. It gets a bit. 
sounds a bit more like Mickey Mouse, which I don't really. I like Mickey Mouse, <laughs> but not, not on the bass. <laughs> yeah. So that's so the that's quote that. of the day. Um, <laughs> yeah. Kevin wants to know if there's anything constraining the movement of the expression pedal or if it's linear. Uh, it's, let me just see. Uh, I don't remember. It, it doesn't go any further than uh, to zero dB. Gotcha. Um, which, um, value, no, that's linear and it's yep. scaled. Yep. So it doesn't go further. It stops at zero. Yep. Perfect. Because, yeah, I like not yep. going overboard with it. Yep. Hmm. Um, yeah, man. So just something I want to point out for viewers, which like, <clears throat> Froda, I'm assuming you agree with this statement, but, um, uh, wow, I've completely lost my train of thought. So sorry. The, the most effective live setup is the one that you can really play. Definitely. Like when you, when you have real <laughs> control, even if you can only really control one thing, like if all you can handle is a little bit of reverb and turning that on and off then that's what you should do you should start with that yeah and, and let me just show you like the the main part which i don't you cannot see it on the screen now because i don't okay. use it all the time this is what i use like if i'm if i'm playing um through um let's say uh excuse me um if if, if i play through the looper i want to see this looper thing so i can yeah. You know, so, and then when I stop it, I want to be able to see that now the play button is not active. Aha, yes. And, and then I can clear it like that, and when I release the pedal, it goes into play again. So next time I hit the record, it will play back because it's so embarrassing when you get like if I'm playing a jazz uh, thing and I get a, um, a section to play an intro or something and then I'm putting stuff into the looper and it's not playing. <laughs> yes. And it's, you know you're playing all kinds of harmonics with maybe with the bow and you're doing stuff and then you're clicking and it's supposed to come out as a soundscape and then it's just silence. Uh, oh, oh, oh well, where is it? So yes. uh, I, I want to have the stuff that I, I need to see at the top. And yeah. towards the bottom here, um, I have the amp. And this I have um, written out in, in um, what do you call, widgets. Yes. It's, it's a Softube uh, Eden World Tour mm -hmm. uh, VST. And I like to have control of, of um, the gain, of everything basically, the EQ section of it. And it's a, it's a really good uh, plugin. It sounds, I used to have a, a big Eden setup back in the days. Mm -hmm. And I think it does a great job of sounding like a bass amp, um, yeah. and and with the cabinets and and everything I've I've written them out. But I don't need to see that while I'm playing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more like I, I come to a gig and I scroll down here, and maybe the front of house engineer tells me that can you can you roll off some bass, and I I can basically do it here. Um, I also have a, a Pro Q3 at the end there, where I have a, yeah, I've got a bass cut there now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, but I don't need to. I don't need to um, get to that bass cut while I'm playing. You know what I need to get to while I'm playing are these these things for for my last gig. It was anyway. Maybe next gig is something else. Right, right, right. I, I also made um, made uh, these delays and reverb. I widgeted them out here mm -hmm. in in the global rack space. This is a delay. It's, uh -huh. it's a Valhalla, so all 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 of these buttons is the Valhalla delay. Yes. And it's I used to for the first few gigs I had this on the main screen uh, with this reverb, which is all those reverb things. Mm -hmm. That's part of the that's the Valhalla. Um, what's its name? Uh, vintage verb. Yep. So all all the parameters uh, are here. But while I'm playing, I never change these high frequencies, the size and attack, early diffusion. I don't need that. I just basically need the mix and and the the length of the thing. And then if I want to change it, I just visit this section. Yes. 
So, yeah. so that's I, I try to keep it simple because that's that's what I was doing at first. I was making a gazillion widgets on the main screen, and I was chucking in all the VSTs I owned almost, and the computer was grinding to a halt, you know, and it was, I couldn't really <laughs> use it. Yeah. Um, but now, now it's it's working pretty well, um, and it's easy for me to add stuff. Um, like I just added this uh, modulation thing. Um, let me see if I can. F where is that? Oh, there it is on on, on the um, on the delay thing. So if I if I have some kind of uh, thing happening. Oh, sorry. Can fade it out a little bit, and then I can. Because I thought that was kind of a cool effect for for like an ending or something that I could just warble it out you know yeah so i just added that just before we went live yeah. actually yeah so, that's really so cool out. yeah that's it it's easy to do and it's good 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 to have some space left here in this uh, in the screen i don't have a lot of space left but I, I have some and it's good to be able to put some buttons there if i decide that i want to have um like a distortion or whatever in 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 the chain then i can access whatever parameter i need just by dropping a button here yeah and this is all in just the, the local rack spaces so i have yeah. th this is my electric basis uh, thing and then i have for a different electric base it looks the same but it's has some different plugins it's got um different preamp this is the uh, omni channel by ways mm -hmm. and um yeah helix i've taken out i don't think it's in there yet no yeah no yeah anyway and then the upright base is Bit different so this is this game yeah and um somebody's asking about a metronome kevin is asking about a metronome you, you when you're doing your looper are you using a metronome or no 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 yeah. so it's just a, it's just a time like when you're done yeah, well, recording and you hit the uh, you see I'm, I'm using the looper more um not not like um not not for playing like um I don't play a groove. Sure. Yeah. And so, so I mean, I can put, I can pull up the metronome, and I have it routed in some kind of uh, rack space like that, that it goes only to my ears and not to the front of the house. Yeah. So, so that is possible, and and uh, but for this kind of looping, which is just like these soundscapes, then mm -hmm. the time <laughs> is not an issue. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you, what are you using? So you have the Valhalla delay. What, what plugin are you using for the looper? The looper is the Melda M Super yes, Looper. Yes, Melda. Yes. So, so sorry. Have, yeah. Yep. It, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it takes it's some getting looper. used to, but I think I've yeah. been able to tame it more or less now. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You mentioned earlier about needing to like switch the EQ when you're switching instruments. Is that built into your rack spaces? So when you move to, you know, yeah. your next rack space, it adjusts the the EQ. Yeah. Well, this is my electric bass setup, as uh -huh. I think it will be for in the foreseeable future um, with the Eden plugin. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it lets me. Uh, it let it lets me do quite a lot of stuff just let me make sure there's no reverb and stuff here. Uh, with its its EQs and I don't know I mean if people are listening on a laptop or phones you're not gonna hear this bass but yeah uh -huh, uh -huh. there's a compressor and there's an enhancer which kind of scoops out it sounds pretty different Mm -hmm. um let's see so yeah this is uh this is uh the eq section for that and um so that's if i have to change something i do it here with the eq and when i change to upright upright bass yeah uh, it's a completely different gotcha preamp so that has nothing to do with with this this eden is in the local rack space gotcha this, gotcha this guy right and yep. for the upright bass, it looks like this. 
I have channel uh -huh. one, which is um, piezo, and then the microphone here. They go into each have their own instance of the Sheps Omni channel, mm -hmm. and um, I have a Pro Q, which are, is not in use now. Uh, it's just bypassed, but it's there because it's good to have. And on the microphone, I have this Waves uh, X feedback, um, so which lets me um, test like if there's any monitors with the bass and I, it's it's feeding back from the microphone, I can not shout the offending frequency. It's really good. It works really well. Wow. It okay. Lets, lets, it gives me like five, six dB more before it feeds back. Wow. Um, yeah, that's great. So, but I, I, obviously, I don't need that on the on the piezo pickup because that doesn't feed back uh, that right. easily. Right. So, and it, it mixes back in here where I can mix between the the Wilson, which is the pickup, and the microphone, mm -hmm. and that I can control uh, on my in my panel here, DI, which is the pickup and mic, and I can mute mute them like this, um, and I can access the preamps. From here also like yeah that. yeah yeah so that's that and it goes into the same global master section so it's the same um, the uh, reverbs and and um, yeah just goes to the global rack space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah so everything that's here to my eyes that I'm seeing has a purpose <laughs> And hopefully <laughs> yeah well I just think it's you know it's super important because like you know, there's no scripting or there's no, you know, whatever it is with like some of the like insane power user setups. There is but, one script and is this Oh, is one. there? What are you using it for? Uh, and it's not working right now. <laughs> there obviously. you go. So well, it's when I switch the instruments. Um, oh, come on. Well, that didn't work. Anyway, uh, there used to be scripting that worked. Oh, look, it worked. Yeah, it did work. So when I select uh, upright bass, uh -huh. I'd want it to be only upright bass. And that's one thing that, that a lot of people have asked for, and I think it might come someday. Uh, radio buttons, yeah. default. Like, so we can choose like two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, mm -hmm. up to mm -hmm. one million or something. Because mm -hmm. it, it's useful to have, for me, it's useful to have one radio button for double bass, which would then open up my, my uh, um, pickup and my microphone. Mm -hmm. And then when I click on electric base one, it opens up my input number three and selects the correct rack space. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's it's kind of um, it's something I use a lot. Yeah, now it's working. So yeah, so that's so, a script I just stole. And I think yeah, there's a great script which I guess you're seeing. I think there's maybe also an extension. Hopefully, I'm not saying that wrong. Um, I have to double check that as I'm saying it live on the internet, but. Yes, I've heard I've heard the radio button request before. Um, yeah. So, but, and, and but, can I request one one more thing? And maybe somebody can tell me that it's already there, which would be yeah. awesome. And uh, that is when I select the tuner. Um, you can select auto detect channel, which is not very good when you have an instrument with a, a live microphone attached, huh. because then it can pick up. You know, it's going to pick up. Um, Yep, it picks up the upright bass. When I'm trying to tune this guy, then it's like difficult to know. So, and this is really small. This uh, thing on screen. With David is waving effects. his hands. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, David. <laughs> um, uh, th this may be a stupid comment, but if you're trying to tune your electric guitar, how about don't play your upright? Yeah, <laughs> but 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 if the upright is, uh, it's it's like I mean now I mean. Elec oh. I'm, I'm in electric bass mode, right? And, okay. And um, so my bass is sounding, and if I'm playing the upright, you only hear this in the room. But if I choose the uh, upright bass, um, let's see now. yeah, then that's in there with the reverb and everything. Um, but still, when I go back to electric bass, the tuner, um, since my rack space is set up like it is, which is probably maybe stupid of me, but where I, where I have uh, the instruments going into the global thingy, um, it seems like Geek Performer is listening up here. 
Well, it's it. that you've got an automatic, so it's listening on any channel. But you can yeah, see. right. And but 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 when 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 I have chosen when I'm playing electric bass, it would be good if I could if there would be somehow a means of putting it in like in this oh, rack so you space. Want, you want you and want the tuner only goes to, to number change, three. You you want to be able to change the default tuner input depending on the rack space that you're in. Yeah. Okay, that's a interesting suggestion. I'll yeah, put in but the tracking it, system. Never been asked that one before. No, because but if 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 I'm trying to tune my electric bass on stage, and if I'm doubling, if I'm also playing upright bass on that gig, and then I'm going, I'm just put my electric bass on. I want to check its tuning, and somebody is playing an intro, like a saxophone is going, and then that goes into my microphone, and then it interferes with the tuner. If if I have it on I auto, we auto light detection, we be using microphones for tuners. We figured it'd be plugged in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wow, but but so here I've got a microphone and I'm blending the two, right? So, but oh, it's, it's wow. a minor thing. Okay, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we we'll put that on a tracking system. I mean, you know, that's a haven't haven't come across that one before. Yeah. It's interesting. That's a that's a that's a great suggestion. Um, in the meantime, there are. And it may be, may help you or not. There are plugins that are basically tuners. Yeah, I know. Uh, both set those up in your rack space. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 yes, this is going to be my solution. But I really like the tuner on here uh, that I can access it from anywhere. I can just well, that's the whole touch idea. the screen you can there. Quickly, quickly jump to it. Yeah, because um, then I don't yeah, have uh, to use uh, a button. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put that. In, I'll put that in a tracking system. I mean, there's no reason why. I mean, even if you had to do it with GP script, you could have a call in a rack space that basically say, "Oh, I'm in this rack space. Set the tuner inputs to be this channel." Yeah, that would be awesome. But um, I bet somebody could write that too. There's yeah. <laughs> no, you, you could you couldn't write that now because no. I don't think GP script has access to the mm -hmm. tuner. Um, uh, that's a that. Well, I, actually, um, what happens if you were? <laughs> well, I have to think about it. Um, well, well, what happens if when you switch? Um, oh no, that, uh, yeah, I was just thinking you could you could make the audio input volumes mute them, uh, but um, but that, that would have to be on the sound device, right? Since yeah, I'm used... no, no, but that that won't that won't help because it's coming in to the rack space before. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, wait a minute. You you want to make sure that when you're doing your electric guitar, that the the one with the microphone on it doesn't interfere. Yeah, so that when I'm, I'm okay. when I'm in oh, my oh. rack space, which is getting like this rack space here. No, hold on, I... hold on a second. I understand. What ha what happens? If you were to turn, you know, down at the bottom, you know, you see where you've, oh, you've got it closed down. Open up that bottom section where you can see all the base. Yeah. Uh, I think it's in the middle and it's covered by your, the, yeah. Yeah. Right. It, you see those volume things? Yeah. Which yeah, one is your, good. which one is your, is your, is your um, microphone? Um, two. So if you mute two. Uh, does the tuner stop working? Does the tuner stop responding to your your bass? How do I mute it? Do I have just to by, pull it down? Just pull it down for now. Okay, but it's that's like channel kind of, three. You said it was channel two. Yeah, yeah. But if I pull it down, then I I suppose it doesn't tune. Well, um, well, hold on. Yeah, but the point the point is you can you can easily have a widget. Tied to that, when you switch to a particular rack space, it would just disable the other input. Okay. Yeah. But I, but you have to check and see whether tuner. Nope. It's going G. So it's still it's working or not working. It's working, it seems. Let's see. Yep, it's working. Okay, but so if you if you block that channel, does it still? It shouldn't work. Uh, it's working. <laughs> oh, so so that so those mixers aren't stopping the tuner. No. Yeah. Okay. I have to have a look at that. We'll put it. We'll we'll put a thing in and we'll look into it. <laughs> how do, how do I get it to where it was? Is it double click? Double yeah, click double on click. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, but that would be awesome. But yeah, I, I'm aware I can put a, a tuner a plug-in, but I really, I really love the fact that I can just point my finger at the screen and there it is. And I, yeah. I, I don't have to use like a button on my controller for a tuner. Yeah. I can just yeah. do this. <laughs> yeah. I have to have a look. Uh, we have to I have to have a look and see how yeah. that. That's a good question. <laughs> I put it in our tracking <laughs> system. Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for coming, David. Um, man, I love all of this so much. This is actually, I think, part of what has made gig performers so. Um, like when you want to do something, it's there is mm -hmm. musicians like you want to do something and it's not there. And then you give the feedback <laughs> and, and we have the real feedback from people who actually have these needs that, you know, mm. it, the, the way that it's been built up, it's like, um, <clears throat> we're actually trying to solve performing musicians problems. Right, so right. anyway, which I just think is really cool and unique. It's like a special thing. That's awesome. Um, Okay, did we, what did we miss? Did we miss anything in your setup? Um, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> it's, um, well, I, I use sometimes, I, uh, what I've learned is that it's very um, unusual for people. A lot of my work, most of my work, uh, is with onstage uh, wedges, monitors, guitar mm. amps, bass amps. Yeah. Not so much in-ear stuff. Mm. There's a little bit. I mean, with the radio orchestra these days, it's always in-ears. Mm -hmm. And but um, like in in bands uh, I play in, it's just all live sound. It, there's no in-ear thing. So when I arrive with my setup without any speakers, um, even though each musician has a monitor on stage, I've gotten some feedback that uh, they are missing. <laughs> you know this big bass mm. sound coming from a bass amp yeah um and but it's some of my best uh, experiences with this has been when i'm using in airs with a double bass in an acoustic setting and i can use the microphone and monitor it and, and have full control and i can i can really hear yeah. my instrument and yeah and then it, that kind of defies the whole thing when i have to put up a monitor and blast some bass through it but I, i've sold it with i have some 12 inch powered speakers that i bring from my car and put it next mm -hmm. to the piano player or whoever <laughs> has, uh, requested it yes so so yeah but um, yeah so so i have a setup with with two 12 inch wedges that i bring sometimes when i'm for rehearsing or something i bring one or two mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. apart from that yeah yeah phones and in -ears. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. So I feel like we've got a fantastic understanding of what you're doing with Gig Performer. Um, <laughs> what are you doing with Blue Cat? And I think that's my my final question for you. Oh, that's uh, this thing. Gotcha. It's like a um, what's it called? That's your pop, that's your pitch. Machine. Yeah, it's not. It's it's a feedback generator ah. kind of thing so you can right now i have have it just set to the second uh, partial i can set it to let me see uh -huh. and then you can set the threshold you can make it fade in quicker or you can set how much of it, it yeah you, you can mm -hmm. set it up any way you want mm -hmm. so i just like it like to get the first octave that's where it was. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. So for anyone who is getting started with Gig Performer, for anyone who's a brand new user, um, what would you suggest to them as a great place to get started or like a good way to get on the right foot using gig performer um to learn uh, to, I, I think i would say try to approach it uh, from what you're used to using mm. like you have one bass amp um mm -hmm. try to find one vst one kind of uh, amp simulator thing if it's uh, there, there's a million great ones out there i have mm -hmm. a lot of them Mm -hmm. and, and build uh, the rack spaces around that. Um, sometimes you might want a different kind of sound. You might want a 
sound of the Ampeg 810s or then you want the sound of these small combos, you can have all of that. But I suggest that you finding just two or three amps and then sticking with that and building stuff around it. And it's a good thing with templates for, for audio based musicians who don't really need a lot, like million different sounds. Like um, if you're playing in a theater band or in a cover band and you're playing keyboards, then obviously if you want it to sound correct, then you need a lot of patches, right? So you need to have, to have these worked out beforehand. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. a bass is, in, is generally not like that, right? Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. yes. it's the sound of a bass and then because for 20, 20 years, I've just plugged into DI boxes and then some sound engineer has been EQing and mixing it, you know, that's mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. keyboard players, you have to have some strings, some piano, some roads and some stuff. And then it's a signature of the stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so to have a good, um, basic bass tone, um, is probably a good start. Yeah. And then absolutely. building things around that. Um, absolutely. So, so I think. At least if you're like in in some kind of open setting, if you have like many different projects, if you play like a gig with this group and then with that group, and then you get called for that, and then you have some, yeah, then then it's it's nice to be able to um, quickly edit stuff um, right. from a basic starting point. Yeah, at least that's that's where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's super valuable, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, it's it's like it gives you a little bit of a jumping off point because you're starting with something that you know. Yeah, you're starting with a, a bass note because when when you're playing bass and somebody is hiring you as a bass player, they don't really want this kind of feedback thing that I just demonstrated. Nobody is hiring anybody for that. This is just something that I use in uh, I used in a, in a situation at a gig and I, I I was playing some intro thing. I was making some atmospheric stuff and different sounds. But normally yeah. the job is to perform solid bass without right. reverb, without delays, without loopers, without anything. So just to find something that does that job just as well as the bass amp did before. And I think these um, modeling things are, are at that level now. Um, they are, they're sounding fantastic. I mean, if you have a Helix, I have the Helix plugin. Mm -hmm. I have IKEA Multimedia's this uh, amplitude thing with all the bass cabs and amps and it's some fantastic simulations. Mm -hmm. So, but there's really there's way too much out there, so you can get buried in all the options. Right, of course, of so, course. So it's probably the same with keyboard. You you really want to have a good piano sound, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to have you you probably you're probably not using tens of millions of different grand pianos. You found one that you're kind of defaulting to right every single time i use yeah. the same sound if i'm going to change it it's after that yeah <laughs> but yeah same one every time yeah so but I, I wasted a lot of time just trying all those millions of bass amps and all those millions of reverbs and choruses i'm sure there are reverbs and choruses that sound better or different than the ones i'm using now but i'm learning to use them and trying to make them fit into what i'm trying to play yes instead of yeah. trying to f buy another one at, on sale <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like no matter what tool you use, you will always be the musician. Yep. So that's true. That is true. It's like, you know, the the reverb or the whatever it is that you're using is only as good as your ability to create and bring bring life to the thing. Like you are the creator. Um and yeah. the tool is supporting that process. And the Definitely. second you lose it, it's gone, you know? Um, I, I don't want the, the effects to totally erase uh, me. <laughs> right. You know? So yes. I want, what, what I'm playing and note choices and dynamics and stuff, it, it, I, I want it to come through. And, and this is how I'm trying to do that. And I'm trying to keep it a little bit simple. And although you can go totally overboard, obviously. Yeah. And it's much easier to to troubleshoot if you don't have a gazillion wires everywhere, you know, and suddenly yes. something isn't working and it's like, ooh. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Frida, thank you so much for sharing all of this. I'm like, this was such a valuable time, especially I'm like, I'm going to go back and re <laughs> I'm going to go back and rewatch it. Um, okay. So thanks for bringing your, your musicality and your approach. Um, and for giving us your time. It's, we're so grateful. Um, friends who are watching, 
we'll be back March 2nd. Um, Froda, there we've got in the description right now for viewers your YouTube channel. Um, so if you guys are watching and you want to see more of what he's doing um, on the internet, at least you can check out his YouTube channel. Um, it seems like uh, you're also active in the gig performer community as well, right? Is that true? Yeah, I've seen when I with... run into problems, I try to ask uh, for <laughs> some help in there. I'm not very technical, so uh -huh. so when it's talk about that you can do it in scripting, then no, I can't. I, yeah. I can play these four strings or five. Or I, I can't really do ones and zeros. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so if uh, people are trying to get in touch with you, YouTube channel is a great way to do that. YouTube um, is good. Yeah. Facebook is also good. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, friends, thank you so much for being. Froda, thank you for being with us. And we'll see you all on March 2nd. Thank you for having me.